Hi. Uh, um, morning, everybody. So I'm new at the center. I should probably say that I come from a primarily terrestrial background. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is a terrestrial example. But hopefully you'll see and, and, and sort of understand that there's a lot of relevance in what I'm speaking about for questions that have come up this morning already, and I think things that many of you are interested in. So what I'm going to focus on is the topic of social ecological networks and the relevance that they have for the sustainability of protected areas in particular. <clears throat> so first, a little bit of background on network theory and network analysis. You can think of networks as systems of nodes and links. So anything that you can represent with a, um, as a, at, at a single location with a dot. Can you see this pointer? No. OK, forget the pointer. Um, if we think about the, the fundamental ways that you can think of the world as a network, pretty much any system that you can think about as a collection of elements that interact with each other. So these dots could represent locations in space, or they could represent people, or they could re represent species that interact in a, in a trophic manner through a food web. Networks have different kinds of topology, different kinds of arrangement. So this slide just shows you some of the basic different kinds of topology. Now, if you think about these in a spatial context, if you imagine these are different locations in space, if you're an organism that's trying to move through a network, these represent fundamentally different problems for you. If you start at this point in a ring network, you've got to go through four or five other nodes to get to the far side of the network. By comparison, if you're in a star network, which might have a same, the same basic amount of habitat, or very slightly more in this example, you've only got to go through one node in that network to get where you want to get to. So the same is true of things like information flow. If you're connected to the internet and you can have immediate access to news updates, you can plan how you buy and sell stocks, for example, or you can make decisions very rapidly on the basis of current information. If you're in a more distributed situation, it's going to take a bit longer for that information to get to you. And these different arrangements of networks um, allow us a way of thinking about the, the implications of interactions for a set of both ecological and socioeconomic processes that are of quite high importance for conservation. <clears throat> so network analysis first became a focus in ecology around the late 1990s. Tim Kite, in particular, had a couple of very influential papers I'm sorry, this is not displaying up here nearly as well as it does on my screen, but this is from his 1997 paper in conservation ecology. If you think about how far an organism can move, what you're looking at here is patches of forest in the, in the, the khaki color, and hopefully you can see the purple lines which indicate what that network looks like if you imagine that you can move between different patches within that landscape. On the left over here is a, is a slide at 10 kilometer potential dispersal distance. So imagine an organism that can move up to 10 kilometers or around has a dispersal range of around 10 kilometers. That's what the network might look like for that particular organism. On the right is an organism that has higher dispersal ability. That's a network at 40 kilometers. So if you zoom in on an aspect of this network, you can see that for the 10 kilometer, the organism that uh, perceives the landscape and moves at a scale of around 10 kilometers, it's a fairly patchy landscape. Whereas with a movement capability of 40 kilometers, it's really only two or three larger patches at this particular uh, scale of analysis. So what this highlights is that scale itself is critical in thinking about networks, and, and um, it has a strong impact on the ways that we perceive and analyze the world. Now, we've been applying network analysis and thinking about protected areas. And the examples I'm going to give you today come from primarily from the Western Cape of South Africa. On the left there is a set of uh, protected area networks over here envisioned at different, um, different dispersal distances. So if you imagine we were thinking about birds in this particular case, but this could equally well be marine protected areas and things like sharks or fishes that might move between them. Going from a, an, what the network looks like at a five kilometer dispersal range up at the top left, all the way down to a 50 kilometer dispersal range. And the key thing here to note is that the network gets denser and denser you have more and more uh, movement capacity as your potential scale of movement increases. Now, as we consider individual protected areas, 
at different scales. So this figure here shows you on the, on the x-axis in each case is that same set of scales, ranging from five up to 50 kilometers. And when I say scale here, I'm talking about potential dispersal distance. And there's a set of things that change fairly predictably in a network as you change the way you define the network contingent on that dispersal capability. So the top left there shows you the proportion of potential connections that are actual connections within this particular network of protected areas. So that's network density on the y-axis, and you can see that it, it, um, it, uh, it declines in exactly the way you would expect from, from common sense as the network becomes more connected. Uh, as you get up to a larger potential dispersal distance, the network becomes more and more connected. The second figure here, figure B, shows you the ratio of possible triangles, so the number, you can form a triangle by connecting three points in a network, that's a potential triangle. If it's actually connected versus the potential for it to be connected provides you a measure of what's termed transitivity. And this is a measure of clustering. So as you increase again the dispersal distance on the x-axis, you get an increasingly clustered network. It starts to form clusters. The bottom left there, we're looking at the mean number of links per node. So again, very much as you would expect, as you increase potential dispersal distance, the number of links, the number of connections from each patch to every other patch goes up. And then if you look at average path length, which is the mean number of steps along the shortest path for all possible pairs of network nodes, we get something like a hump-shaped relationship. And this is partly a scaling effect where at small scales and very large scales, the number of different clusters in the network goes down. So we've tried applying this to protected areas in South Africa. This again shows you spatial scale on the x-axis here. And these colored lines indicate different protected areas. Now what we've done in this case is an analysis where you take out each of these parks individually and look at the change in overall network connectivity. So it's a way of getting at the impact of that individual protected area on the overall connectedness of the network. And what we see is something quite interesting and a little bit unexpected, which is we have parks, if you look at the, at the top there, which is Hexburg Nature Reserve, at five kilometers, it's somewhere around average in terms of its importance for overall network connectivity. As we increase the spatial scale, the importance rank of that network, of that particular protected area relative to the entire network increases hugely. And you can see the same trends in a number of other parks and then there's others where uh, their, their potential importance within the network for overall network connectivity doesn't change. So this is raising some profound questions about the way we do conservation planning. Most conservation plans, uh, a typical approach would be to develop a, 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 some kind of spatial grid at a particular resolution and to select patches of habitat for conservation action based on that plan. But what this shows is that the importance of that individual patch to the network as a whole is very clearly scale dependent. So if you choose to run your analysis at a particular scale, you immediately lock in to a particular set of potential solutions, which may or may not be good solutions if you're trying to conserve a broad functional landscape. So the implication of this is that rather than thinking about conservation problems and networks at a single scale, we actually have to, it's a lot more work, but we don't really have a choice to run these kinds of analyses across multiple scales and then look at a more integrative measure, for example, to take the area under one of these curves as a measure of the overall contribution of that location to network connectivity. Now, moving on from these more simple network metrics, one of the things we'd like to be able to do with network analysis is to analyze changes in networks and to draw inferences from that about changes in system resilience or vulnerability to particular things that we're interested in. In theory, network structure should be able to tell us about emerging vulnerabilities within particular systems. So this figure on the right is a, is a sort of a, a guess at what we would expect, going from a low vulnerability situation on the left to a higher vulnerability situation on the right. So for example, if you look up at the top there at network density, we'd expect that as a network gets denser and denser, it becomes more vulnerable to a particular kind of disturbance. So we're thinking about, for example, uh, unwanted fire within a system or the contagious effects of disease, anything negative that's gonna travel through a network and have a potentially negative outcome for the network as a whole. 
as the network becomes increasingly less compartmentalized, it also becomes more vulnerable to that kind of disturbance, we would expect. And then there's some, so those are properties of the network as a whole in the top half. In the lower half here, I've outlined a few properties of particular interest for individual nodes. So if we're looking at a particular protected area and trying to understand how its relationship to other protected areas might affect its vulnerability, we would expect, for example, that a contagious disturbance would increase with uh, connectedness at the bottom here, with this measure called betweenness centrality, which is again is a measure of how quickly things move uh, from that particular node out or in to the network, or um, looking at infection chains. Now keep in mind that if we're talking about a network uh, and we're interested in the transmission of favorable influences, for example, if these represent management networks and we're interested in uh, improving knowledge exchange through the network, you just have to flip this figure around. So a manager who's uh, receiving and being um, aware of the latest advances in management technology would do better to be highly connected than, than under-connected, right? So a lot of this is context dependent. I'm focusing here on, on the example of a contagious perturbation that's negative, but if you want something to travel through a network, you need to think about it the other way around. But either way, uh, the challenge here is can we come up with measures in networks that give us some insights into um, the vulnerability of the network as a whole? So I don't have time now to go into a lot of details, but we've done some validation analysis using data from an a network of ostrich movements in a production system. I've spoken uh, about this before at the, at, at the center in Townsville. And we found quite good evidence. I'm just going to tell you the, the outcome because I don't have time to go into all the details right now. But we found quite good evidence that you can predict farm level vulnerability to outbreaks of disease using betweenness centrality in particular. So this figure on the right shows you on the left hand side there a measure of betweenness centrality. The histogram that's outlined is that a property of betweenness centrality measured for every farm in our analysis. So how connected those farms were to other farms, essentially. The black bars in the histogram are farms that were uh, hit by the, the epidemic, avian influenza outbreak. And you can see that they're very strongly clustered on the right-hand side. So the ones that had the highest betweenness centrality in this example actually were the hardest hit by a large avian influenza epidemic when it happened in 2011. And this is intriguing because it suggests that we might be able to predict vulnerability not just of ostrich farms, but of, of, of other uh, things that we're interested in from a conservation perspective using measures like betweenness centrality. So we've been working a lot on protected areas in South Africa. On the left-hand side is a, is a figure of provincial, national, uh, provincial and national level protected areas in South Africa. On the right-hand side, each of those red dots is a private protected area. So these are private conservation lands um, that we've been working in to try to understand how they relate, how they fit in to the conservation network as a whole, and what their overall contribution is to conservation in Southern Africa. So it's a situation where we have a, a hierarchical arrangement by scale, also by institutional level. So the national parks are governed by national level legislation, provincial parks is a provincial or state level um, legislation, and then private parks, there's some national legislation, but it's, it's a different set of, of issues over private property and tenure rights. And they're also connected as members of multiple networks, ecological networks, social networks, and socioeconomic networks. <clears throat> so the social network is defined by manager interactions. We find there's two fundamentally different kinds of private protected area. In the blue are protected areas that focus on large game species, and in the red are uh, habitat reserves where people are mainly walking. And managers are interacting in a whole, whole range of ways, exchanging knowledge, they're sharing wildlife in the, in the big game reserves, they're sharing resources. We can also view this spatially. So this is a spatial visualization of the data I just showed you, showing interactions between private protected areas in the Western Cape. And what's intriguing here is there's a couple of clusters where you can see that you have, uh, sorry, the, the, the size of the dot indicates how many interactions they're involved in. <coughs> so each of these protected areas is belonging to a whole range of networks. Location is affecting their membership in that network. And we've been trying to understand what the role of location and context is in defining these connectivity of areas to other areas and the ways in which that network is structured. So down at the bottom right here is another analysis. This shows you translocations of large mammals between different protected areas between 2001 and, and 2011. You can see there's been a large increase. So the network's got a lot denser over a 10-year time period. We don't really have, a, have a, a fully clear answer to some of these questions yet. We've also been looking at tourist uh, use of national parks. So 
people moving between different protected areas in South Africa, including the national parks. Again, the size of the node here indicates um, the, uh, the, the overall number of links going to the node. And you can see there's some protected areas like Kruger National Park, which are very much part of a network. So a lot of people who go to a national park in South Africa will also go to, to Kruger Park. And these people are functioning as economic links. They're connecting different protected areas with the revenue that they bring. And it, it, uh, one of the things we've been trying to understand from a parks management point of view is whether you have clusters, natural clusters within these groupings where uh, the, the, the management agencies could potentially pitch package tours or things that would bring people into that particular cluster of parks where they can get a, a desired range of experiences. So as I say, uh, we're still working on a lot of this and putting together some of the data sets. Some preliminary results though, proximity is predicting interactions better than organizational membership. And we've been thinking about the idea of social corridors. So ecologists are thinking a lot about movements of animals, using ideas about ecological corridors, but we're also seeing social corridors building up through these interactions over time. In South Africa, many of the private areas are underconnected, which means that managers are less likely to share innovations and resources. I think a lot of them are scared of competition. Um, and there's a potential intervention point there for some kind of conservation action in terms of bridging between different uh, uh, private park managers to get more cohesive conservation strategies. And third, we're finding interesting shifts and changes in the roles of the provincial and national parks. So in the Western Cape, the provincial parks are acting as a scale-crossing broker. They're bridging between the smaller private areas and the large national parks and transmitting information. Whereas in the Eastern Cape, the same role is being filled by the national parks. And we're still trying to understand exactly why that is. So I don't, unfortunately don't have time to go into a lot of this in, in much more detail, or perhaps fortunately from your perspective. Um, but just in closing, I'd like to say protected areas are social ecological systems and their long-term persistence is not just a question of their ecology. There's a lot of economic, social, political factors going on that are driving what happens in those protected areas. And they're not independent of each other. They're interacting quite strongly. And there's also a set of interactions with entities outside the protected area network that are quite important. So understanding these different kinds of connectivity and the roles of network membership should in theory provide useful insights into the functioning and overall resilience of protected areas. And one of the things that's fairly high on my agenda right now starting out uh, at the Coral Reef Center is to expand this research more and I'd like to compare marine and terrestrial protected area networks and see if we start getting the same results or if marine protected area networks are doing something very different. So if you're interested in this, please um, come and chat to me. I'm very open to collaboration and I would love to hear from people who are working on related problems. Thank you. I don't know if I have time for questions or not. Thank you. Thank you.